喵，喵喵，喵喵喵喵喵，喵喵喵。What I like about 喵，喵喵，喵喵喵喵喵，喵喵喵。I am so thrilled. This game is like sunshine dust. I am enjoying my delicious tasty treat. It is mmm. Well, I'm so happy. Ice cream. <sighs> Time for a dramatic reading of lyrics. I'm the one that you dread. I shred and get heads and treat at a hole with soul made a leg. You know what to say to forgive and forget the regret when they say I'm a pain in my bed. Why do my lyrics sound like Dr. Seuss? <sighs> It's my party, we can have bananas. Bananas? Bananas. And we're gonna go bananas, cause we love bananas. You want a banana? Here. It's my banana and I can love it if I want to. It's my banana even I smack it with Mikey. Oh, it's my banana if I party with bananas. <laughs> All right, we just wrapped up Poison Apple. It's coming out spring break around March 8th. Uh-oh, oh, get ready, shit. blood on the dance floor, Jeffree Star, we're back. Welcome to the Davi Vanity Files. It just so happens that this person blocked me over a year and a half ago when I announced publicly on social media that I was going to look into this guy and make a video. And within less than 10 minutes of me even saying that somehow, some way, I was blocked on all of the social media, including Instagram. Um, so it just goes to show that this person is constantly on the lookout for anybody who talks about him in any capacity. The fact that I was blocked so quickly, so fast, by somebody who I've never actually interacted with. He is one of those people who is constantly looking on the internet to see anything negative said about him. And he goes out of his way to block those people before they even have a chance to reach out to him or try to attempt to talk to him. This is a fairly serious X-Files video because my goal here with today's video and unlike all my other X-Files, today's video specifically is for two reasons. One, to bring awareness of this individual, and two, in hopes that anyone who comes across this video shares it with somebody else, there's the potential that they will see this video and they will not get hurt by this person. As far as I'm aware, over 15 different individuals who have been hurt by this man, and somehow, some way, he just hasn't been caught yet. But before we begin, special thanks to the sponsor of the channel today. You've heard of them before, Raycon. Raycon has created the everyday earbud, and they feel and they sound better than ever. I can't stress enough how comfortable these are to put right into your ear, like so. And look at that. They don't come flying out either. They have a variety of different color of earbuds. They even have these gel tips for the perfect fit right into your ear. But most of all, they offer eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. But that's not all. These earbuds are a fraction of the price of your normal premium earbuds that you would buy on the market today. In addition, they have over 45,000 five star reviews. And if you use my discount code link down below in the description, buyraycon.com slash repsion, you're gonna get 15% off your order on these incredible Incredible earbuds, a fraction of the price, 15% off. Click the link down below in the description, check them out today, and help support the channel. All right, all right, so here's what happened. I was doing an interview, and somebody went a little personal, and I took my microphone and I smacked on the head like this. I'm sorry, I've got anger issues, I can't help it. I believe in every single one of you inside this room right now. We are not a fan base. We are a cult. And if you know that we are a cult, then you know too much, and we can't tell you anymore. Da -da -da. Around 2006 and 2007, Davi Vanity was a scene kit, which identified with obnoxiously bright colors, essentially creating what was known as the MySpace scene. I don't remember if you remember photos like this that were very, very common and popular back in the MySpace days. I was still a religious kid, so these types of things really scared me. But he was a hairstylist, and he was known for his crazy hairstyles, which evolved into him creating a band known as Blood on the Dance Floor. Now, this video is not a band origin 
story, but throughout the years, band members left and came in because even all the way back in 2006, 2007, 2008, things were floating around in the air about the type of inappropriate stuff that he would say and how he would interact with fans who were underage. Let's be clear, this all is just a rumor that blew out of proportion back in 2009 of September uh, during the time I was 23. Uh, basically, I, a girl accused me of rape um, she took a rape kit, she failed the rape kit, and they proved my, my innocence. Now, if you pull up, uh, if you go and type in uh, Dobby Vanity Police Report, which I'm going to go ahead and do right now, I'm going to pull it up and we'll go into it. Uh, you'll see it's a, it's a report. It's not a charge. It's not anything. Um, it's just basically saying that I was detained. So during this incident after the show, um, you know, I went down to the police station and... Uh, as you look at the, if you look at the police record, you can see that I was facing uh, a sexual assault, first degree felony. Um, and it was on September 13th, 2009. Now, naturally, information was kind of left out from Davi himself, but this is an article from the Huffington Post, which is linked down below in the description if you want to read the full thing. But Torres was arrested in 2009, apparently after a woman accused him of S.A. at one of his shows. He later claimed that the woman had, quote, seemed to have underlying mental issues. Police took him into custody and then released him. Witnesses who were present on that night alleged the incident tell a different story. It was September 12, 2009, and Blood on the Dance Floor was performing in Denver, according to McLaughlin, who was still singing alongside Torres at the time, and a woman named Elise, who did not want to use her full name, who was selling merch at the show. That night, they said what led McLaughlin to quit the band and accuse Torres of P. After setting up the venue, McLaughlin said that he and a friend to hang out in the tour van before the show started. To their surprise, the van had been moved to a location where it was, quote, dark and no one was around. They opened the doors and found Torres inside with two girls who appeared to be really young teenagers, he said. Torres chased us away. He didn't want us near the van, said McLaughlin. Time passed and it was getting close to showtime, but according to McLaughlin, Torres was nowhere to be found. The tour van was gone and he showed up just in time before they went on stage. We play probably two songs, the lights come on in the building, the sound gets cut, we're done. They won't let us play. There's somebody up at the sound stage mentioning us for get off the stage, said McLaughlin. In my head, I'm just wondering, what did Dobby do? The band stormed through the crowd to figure out what was going on. Police cars had surrounded the building and an officer asked for Torres for his name, then handcuffed him against the wall, according to McLaughlin and Elise. Once inside, once outside, McLaughlin said he noticed that one of the girls he'd seen in the van was sitting on the ground, speaking to the police officer, pointing at Torres. She sobbed and said Torres had forced her to perform oral. In its story, Metal Sucks published an unverified copy of what appears to be an arrest record from the Colorado Police Department documenting S.A. committed by Torres. It's dated September 13, 2009, the day, of the, the day they performed in Denver. Huffington Post was unable to verify the documents, the legitimacy, or confirm the charges ever filed. A representative at the Colorado Bureau of Investigations would not arrest, would not say if any arrest records existed in Torres, and that the court documents were sealed and not accessible to journal journalists or the public. Now, what a lot of folks don't know is that when something is sealed, specifically involving somebody who is underage, those documents, because it's a minor, are by default sealed and not accessible to journalists or the public. A lot of people don't realize this is that when minors are involved, it's not public record. When people are 18 plus, it is public record. Right after this, Garrett, one of the band members, saw this and left the band, which made Davi Vanity very angry because now a band member was accusing him of what other people had accused Davi of, and that is being involved with underage women. He made two very angry, disgruntled posts about how his best friend backstabbed him simply for believing what the arrest record alleged. And it wasn't soon after that that then Jeffree Star made his famous tweets about Blood on the Dance Floor, tagging them. These are very, very old, but these tweets are in fact real. Jeffree Star has even confirmed them to be real, though I don't really know about the credibility of Jeffree Star himself since I believe him he's to be a kind of a pathological liar. And he always strikes me to somebody who kind of just shifts, narrative shifts whatever is more popular whatever can get him more money. I don't know, he's just kind of a slime ball in my personal opinion, because he said these statements and then he went back on the statements and then he toured with him, uh, Davi, after he said these things about him. It, it, it's weird. What you're about to see in here next is a compilation of multiple different interviews that I've compiled together and condensed down with information. So you can see this pattern of behavior clear and simple. The Davi Vanity has one type of goal, to seclude and go after women who are struggling from a broken home and who are vulnerable by using his music, but also his influence to appeal to this peace and love, acceptance, we're a community, we are a cult. Like mentality to make women feel 
in, uh, feel wanted, to feel in that they're they're included in this tight knit scene community. Spiritual, um, and 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 sort of give them the power, and give them the strength to face their obstacles every single day with love. And love is a very unmeasurable, powerful wave energy that can alter um, anybody's moods from a pit of despair to, you know, a helping hand of hope. I should have been called, like, love on the dance floor because it's just like, <laughs> our music is really about love, whether it's making love or expressing <laughs> love or shoving love down your throat, it's just Despite them having a troubled background, it's the perfect place for him not only to manipulate control, but get away with crimes. So we go out to his car, it's like this big Tahoe. Um, he's like, hey, uh, he gets in the back seat, he's like, hey, can you, can you come help me with something? And um, so I get in the back of the car to figure out what he wants. And um, he grabs the back of my head really hard, like to where like some of my hair gets pulled out. And um, he like, he opens his pants and he shoves my face on him and makes me give him oral. He already exploits very young women. The fact that I had already had an experience like that, he probably felt like I was an easier target. It was so aggressive that my teeth cut the insides of my lips. They were, they were bleeding. And um, after that, he was just like asking if I was okay and can I keep a secret and just, it's just between us and he called me his little school girl and he's like i'm so proud of you at the time first when he tried to kiss me i just felt like well maybe this is just what you know boys do when they you know they like you i was only 13 i had no idea any of that so i just thought maybe i guess he really likes me so he suggested that we see a movie together um so we could have some like time alone and just he said get, to get to know each other and stuff like that and he was trying to set in place his plan of um he set out, he knew what he was doing from the moment he got in his vehicle and drove to the two hours, that whole time he knew. So uh, just his plan to, um, you know, take advantage of a child, pretty much. Um, we, in the movies, he kept on trying, like during the movie, he kept on trying to make out with me the whole time. Um, and there was a point where he actually tried to take my hand and put it down his pants saying like, sorry. I just felt like a, I felt like I didn't want to disappoint him because he seemed so aggressive and so like, is like irritated that I didn't want to do that. You know, I was only 13 years old. I sh nobody should be in that situation. But uh, as a child, I was not equipped to deal with that at all. Um, well, once we came out of the movies, it was dark. Um, and I didn't think about this when he parked his vehicle. He parked behind the movie theaters um, and he parked near a dumpster and a tree that hung over. Um, so by the time that the movie was finished, uh, we had to walk through this tunnel, which was kind of secluded, and then to the back of the movie theater, which was nobody was there. Um, and his vehicle was then parked in even a more secluded space. So as we approached his car, we got in and I was just thinking, you know, like we're gonna go to my friend's house, like he's gonna drop me off. And he proceeded to, um, sorry. Uh, he proceeded to expose himself and try to make me give him oral. Um, and pretty much was uh, threatening that, how are you gonna get home? Um, you know, cause 10 o'clock at night, you know, I didn't drive two hours for this and um, yeah, I was put in that position because I didn't know how to remove myself at the time and I didn't have the confidence to do so. He, I was sitting down in this little chair um, facing like a, a mirror and he was, you know, messing with my hair and he was cutting my hair and he started grinding his, his he just started grinding on my shoulder and um, I was like, oh, maybe I'm in his way. So I start, you know, lowering my shoulder a little bit. So you know, I can get out of his way, but it became more prominent and uh, I started getting a little uncomfortable. The next thing he did was he, it was just so fast. It was like zero to a hundred. And he, um, with the shears still in his hand, he just grabbed my head and forcefully, like I didn't even see him pull his pants, to, like open his pants, pull anything out. It was the next thing I know, my mouth is on his penis and he's forcing me to give him oral. This is in the middle of getting extensions and a haircut. Out of the blue, I was I was so shocked. It was like like when you're playing Call of Duty and there's like a flashbang that goes off and it kind of just like mutes you and you're just like in this daze and this shock. You know, I 
it just I, I like couldn't hear anything. I was I felt very, very numb. Um, and I do remember um, trying to pull away and it just made him push on harder. And um, he was just like, you know, you know, uh, I know you like this. This is almost done uh, to, to that effect, um, something of uh, giving me the inkling that this is something that I'm not not wanting that um, I'm enjoying this. And um, I was alone. I had gone to a couple of concert venues alone. My mom's friend who was a cab driver was outside waiting the whole time. And we were kind of chatting and he was like, hey, you know, I'm gonna have you go watch the opening band and then come back upstairs and we'll hang out for a little bit. I was just excited that somebody who was semi-famous wanted to hang out with me. Um, I was uh, I was kind of the the black sheep of my friend group and of my family growing up. So, um, anybody wanting to hang out with me was really a cool thought because I did not have many friends growing up. He asked me to come with him to the bathroom. And we went to the bathroom and he started to kiss me, which at the time I didn't think much of. Um, I didn't really kiss back for a few minutes until you know, I was like, okay, this is really happening right now. But then it turned into forced orals. And after that, I'd actually lost a chunk of hair that night. Um, my mom made a comment about how I had a giant knot in the back of my head and half my ponytail was missing. He was pulling my, my hair. I had my hair, he put my hair in a ponytail and was pulling on it. Afterwards, he gave me a t-shirt and told me to change my shirt so there was no evidence and he left and I hung out in the bathroom for a few minutes and I texted a couple of friends and I went downstairs and I watched the rest of the show. Uh, I was 11 years old. Starstruck, I mean ecstatic. I was so happy I finally got to meet him in Sirius and Pope. I was 15 or 16 years old and I had lost a significant amount of weight. And so I basically was you know, turning into a woman. I was not a woman yet, I was still a girl, obviously. I went to one of his shows, I never missed one. And I woke up that next day to a message from him on Facebook asking me what I was doing that day. Uh, I looked really good at the concert and he wants to hang out with me because he had a day off in Denver. He was asking me all these weird questions. He was being very vague and like cryptic, telling me that he's gonna miss me so much uh, because he's not gonna see me for you know an indefinite period of time. And, we needed to end that night on a good note. He ended up kissing me that night during the movie. I mean, I swear I probably did not watch a single minute of that movie because he was just all over me. So I didn't I didn't stop it. And I was actually very excited after he kissed me that night. And oh, mind you, this was my first kiss ever. He was like, let's go to a Denny's or, you know, some 24 hour place where we can hang out. And I just kept telling him no. And come on, let me just see how far this hotel is from you. So he got my address. I had already done my nightly routine. I was in my pajamas in bed. And so I live in the basement. My signal is pretty bad on my cell phone. And he kept telling me that I was breaking up. So I had to go outside. And to my surprise, he was outside of my house when I went outside in shock. I didn't know what his plans were. I, we didn't have a set plan. I didn't know why he wanted to hang out uh, because I live in a you know, very small town away from the city. There's nowhere to do anything around here. And he said, let's just hang out in the van. I was like, okay, you know, in my pajamas, no makeup on, nothing, uh, because I wanted to go to bed. He pulled the same thing that he did at the movie theater, pretty much just telling me that we, he's gonna miss me so much and asking me if I'm gonna miss him and we need to end this on a better note like we have unfinished business. And I still didn't really know what he meant. So I did end up giving him oral, and he was very, very violent. And I mean, I was bleeding he was ripping my hair out. He wouldn't let me breathe. It was, and it was my first ever experience like that ever. Yeah. And it definitely, it haunts me sometimes, but I also feel like it's something that I have repressed and I haven't really had the chance to talk about it or deal with it. But for being my first experience, it definitely warped my perception of, you know, what intimacy should be. And it, it has followed me into adulthood. Definitely. I thought it was I mean, I can't, I can't lie at that time. I was like, oh, that's cool, you know? Like, he wants to, like, come get me himself. Um, I didn't see anything wrong with that, but it got weird when he called me because he didn't want to speak to my mom. Um, he wanted me to actually, I was, like, really, like, oh, mom, he's on the phone. Like, he wants to talk to you. And she, he's like, no, 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 don't, don't give the phone to your mom. I need you to, like, go in your room, lock the door, um, and I need you to, like, 
you know, talk to me alone. And that's when everything got weird after that, because in order to get those tickets, he, he was saying, if I wanted them so bad, I would have to give him what he called an oral report. No, I didn't know about sex at all, really, at 16. My mom was a young mom. She kind of kept that, you know, quiet. She took me kind of out of sex ed. Like, I was just kind of, what do you mean? Like, you want me to tell you why? Like, you want me to give you, like, a reason why I want these tickets? And he said, oh, you know what I mean? Like, a, you know, oral. And that's when I it clicked and I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm only 16. Like, I've never done anything like that before. And he couldn't really take no as an answer, but he was very good at convincing you. Like, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's amazing. It's something like, you know, you've never experienced it before. Can you believe you get to experience it with me? Like someone you look up to. And he would say like comments like, oh, you'll love it. Um, it tastes like ice cream. And uh, I was just kind of, he could tell that in my voice, I was like, uh, no. Uh, so he would switch the subject. And then that's when we got the conversation about schoolgirl fantasies, which ended up being like the theme of our whole entire relationship. The time we met up, he wanted me to dress up like a schoolgirl, And he actually convinced me to be a schoolgirl for Halloween at 16. And I took photos in it. He, he was really interested in my chest and he wanted to see, and he couldn't really take no as an answer, but he was very good at convincing you. Like it's, it's, it's awesome. It's amazing. It's something like, you know, you've never experienced it before. Can you believe you get to experience it with me? Like someone you look up to. And he would say like comments like, oh, you'll love it. Um, oh, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know better. I just, you know, this was new to me. This is the first guy I ever, anything like this with i mean he knows he's a predator he's told me that he's attracted to younger girls uh he's there's been times i mean he trusted me so much because we had known each other for so long at his most vulnerable moments like if he was drunk or if he, he would cry about it he was i'm sick i don't know why i'm like this um I, you know even when we were dating last year um you know I, we had issues with with him snapchatting young girls and he would show me pictures of girls that were snapchatting him and uh, they were underage and he's like, I know, I know, I just, you know, I, they, you know, they want to, it's, it's fine. He got me alone in his room to help him with his makeup and he started like touching my chest and like saying like really like outwardly sexual things and I was like so confused because that was never the way our friendship went and then he texted me to follow him later on so we were ready to go and I followed him inside and he like pushed me down on an office chair in his room and he like forced my head into his crotch and just kind of forced me to perform oral with no consent or option. He told me, don't ever tell anyone what happened, I'll kill you. And I was shocked and I was like, "Have?" I asked him, have you been wanting to do that since you met me? And he said, yes, of course. And I said, I was 12 when we met. He goes, yeah, I know. Now, a lot of people don't talk about the whole J. Vaughn McRow incident, which right when he turned 18, D Davi Vanity hired him into his band, considering that a lot of people had left and he didn't, they didn't want any association with him at this point. But what's so scary about the situation is Davi took a male fan of his right when he turned 18, got him suckered into his environment, and basically was bait playing the whole string puppet maneuver, controlling not only his finances, paying for everything, but isolating him from all of his friends and family, and anyone who would speak negatively of Davi himself, to the point that eventually Jay Vaughn had to make a statement on Davi Vanity publicly, and officially pulled away from his manipulation and control. But he personally felt that when your fan base is made of teens, these are usually sub subjects you want to avoid considering most of Davi's music was very, very sexual. When he joined at 18, he didn't feel that inappropriate about it, but until he became older, it felt very pervert singing songs these type singing these types of songs to kids. You know, he does have a point when your audience is primarily ages like 10 to 15 years of age, and the content that you're making and the comments that you make are almost all inherently sexual towards underage and minors. Red flag alert, red flag alert, that's not normal. And one of the things that a lot of people don't nor uh, don't talk about is that when you have somebody who is almost 30 years old, you know, making music for young 15 year old girls, these young girls like look up to this dude. They're striving for attention to, to be accepted for validation from him. And it's not normal for a 30 year old man to be wanting to hang out with 15 and 16 year olds. That's just not normal. The problem is, is, is that Davi Vanity normalized this type of behavior and a lot of these young teens didn't see anything wrong with it because they had never seen this type of interaction with male other influences. So they deemed this type of behavior that Davi Vanity exhibits as normal and it's not. It is not normal for a 30 year old man to be driving to young girls' houses to hang out with teens. And if you know anybody who's, who, who's doing that and there's a guy or girl doing that with a 
a young teen boy or a teen girl, that's sus. You're not gonna convince me otherwise. I went a few years touring and working for the band, but Davi insisted not paying me. Instead, he wanted to be somewhat of a caretaker and play the role of the beginning, and I allowed it because I was young and overwhelmed by the glory of being 18 and touring the nation to meet people who enjoyed the same things as I did. I was too timid, and with Davi's short temper that he had displayed on many occasions by firing his employees with absolute no reasoning, I feared I would be his next. I didn't want to push his buttons and be left with nothing. He paid my phone bill, paid my car insurance, half my rent as well, my medical insurance. Instead of just paying me how an employee should be, but I had enough of this weird daddy relationship. My mother would always ask why I had never had any money and why I couldn't afford to go to, to hometown in Florida. It's ruined relationships for me, not with just boyfriends, but people who worked for him and other bands we toured with. I was manipulated to dislike anyone who tried to call Dobby Vanity out. At some point, a few years into the band's career, I had a long talk with him about maybe just paying me so he didn't have to take care of me all the time. He gave in and put me in a retainer that was mostly late or incompatible with our agreement. Instead, he kept me under his thumb so as to make sure I couldn't leave and was as codependent on our relationship. The band had a manager. He became responsible for paying me, and it lasted almost a year until the manager was fired. There was times that I literally had nothing, yet Dalvi was spending lavishly on ridiculous novelties, custom-made clothing, and flying random girls to stay and live with us. I finally started to work independently after getting, quote, getting permission from Davi in late 2014. I'd gotten sick and for a shortly while after I was diagnosed with HIV, I needed to get medication and medical help started, yet there was a tour that was booked as the band. He just kept pushing in my face that we couldn't afford to cancel the tour and that any medical help that I need would just have to wait until we came back for my treatment. He couldn't afford the tour because the extreme $60,000 in debt Davi had put himself in. I agreed against my better judgment to go on tour and was dragged all through the country, sick as a dog, and waited out. The tour was a total bust, attendance was low, everything was rushed, Dates were canceled. When I got home, I immediately got treatment and after a few months had passed and a new health routine, I was back to myself. Davi paid me $1,000 to write all the material in less than two week period. It was just too much work for too little money. And after what happened with the last tour and general feeling of being taken advantage of by Davi for a long time, I left the band. I needed a new life. I couldn't live in this situation anymore. I had nowhere to go. He knew that, so he took advantage of that. Couldn't take it away any longer. So I left. Recently, Davi opted to continue the tour as Blood on the Dance Floor, still selling merch with my name and face on it, singing my name onto posters I've never seen or touched, and obviously still playing music I wrote for him. On top of not being paid for any of this merch sales and my likeness, he's now saying that he's on, out on stage performing in my honor, obviously trying to capitalize on my own illness as he referred to his fans. It's so insensitive and unnecessary. I've been through hell and back, still fighting, being mocked by him as some kind of cruel joke. At this point, nobody should be working for Davi Vanity. And if you're friends with this scumbag, there's something seriously wrong with you. Hello, my name is Jesus David Torres. I am the lead singer of Blood on the Dance Floor. I'm here to address the accusations that are made against me. Of course, I am not here to make accusations about anybody else. This is just to add clarity to all the accusations and bullshit people have made of me. So the awful rumors began back in 2009. I played a show, and after the show, I had relations with a woman. And after I had relations with a woman, she seemed to have underlying mental issues. Next thing you know, I'm being arrested by police. I go down to the police station. I, I tell my side of the story. She takes a rape kit. She fails a rape kit. They prove my innocence. I was never charged with a crime. You can look up my name on public records. Jesus David Torres. Um, you can see I was never charged as a sex offender or any of that stuff. But yet, people threw in their accusations and they made their rumors and blogs and next thing you know i'm public enemy number one so after all this drama went down of course hey let's jump on the bandwagon let's make accusations against blood on dance floor and the case of the girl that with the Udungu video obviously this was a teenager with mental issues who posted online so at that point we're just like what the hell is going on like there was never any legal accusations. There was never any court dates. There was nothing. You you can't find any records of it because it never happened, folks. Uh, no matter what people blogged about or whatnot, it was clearly nonsense. So I might want to add a reminder to everyone that there is a parental warning advisory when you purchase the album. So there is a warning. This music is not intended for children. It is for audience that are mature, that are 18 and older. Now, if somebody younger listens to it, that's not our fault. That's their choice to listen to it. And it's not that we purposely or secretly try to gear our music towards a younger audience. We actually gear our music for an older audience. So that doesn't really make any sense. The point is, is that just because I write a song called Yoho and it's about a pirate, doesn't make me a real life fucking pirate. If you do see somebody defaming me, 
please do not respond with hatred. Respond with wisdom. That's the message to all of this. I hope that I've enlightened people and that I've guided people in the right direction. Take care. Thank you for your time. Peace. Dobby Vanity's response here is a blatant contradiction because his shows, for those of you who don't know, were all ages shows. All ages. You cannot have an all ages show and then pretend to pander to only 18 plus. And it's very clearly if you do some digging on the internet and watch old footage and band tour music and all that stuff, that these people are not 18. In fact, a lot of the people who have spoken out against Davi Vanity on their experiences and what he did to them and forced them to do and participate in were all under the age of 18. All right, I just got here to Vegas, almost ran over a hooker, and uh, about to get a little naughty. Let's get a little naughty. So in the city, I got my horns out. I'm horny. <laughs> Not entitled to be ignorant. Uh, there's been an incident where I asked for bras on stage. Now, this was during a show, and I basically said, "Hey, throw your bras on stage or whatever." Um, you know, at the time, I was really influenced by bands like All Time Low and Blink One Eighty Two, who do this in all their shows. If you ever go to a Blink One Eighty Two show or if you go to an All Time Low show, um, I actually we toured Warp Tour with All Time Low. So, of course, you know. I was drunk, I was high one night, I'm saying some stupid shit on stage. I admit my wrong. I, I did it. I asked for bras on stage. Am I, was that the best thing for me to do? No, that was a very shitty thing for me to do. It was terrible. Um, and I'm still suffering from that. Let me, let me make this clear to everybody. When I was asking for those bras on stage, I was asking that from mature women, older women. I wasn't asking it from teenagers or any of that crazy shit. A thing I saw on the, the truth about Dabby Vanity blog on Tumblr where someone was saying I was sending a nude photo to an underage girl. Let's make this loud and clear. The photo I sent of me covering up my private parts was a girl named Tiffany Davis. The girl at the time was 18. It was just her 18th birthday. Yeah, that's pretty close. Um, she, she went from 17 to 18. I sent her that, that image. It wasn't my dick. It was just me covering up my private parts. It was just a provocative picture. However, you know what? She was 18 and people don't even know that. Now, do I make music for kids or teenagers? No, you know, I never, never ask for kids to, to come to my show or do that. Uh, clearly, there's a parental advisory warning on my CDs and I gear my music towards 18 year olds and up. You know, do I, do I control what people listen to or how old they are? No, I don't. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, like when I play sexting, I have to, I can't look at people in the face or look at them in the eye if they're younger, cause it's just weird. 
um, you know, do I gear my music towards a younger audience? No, I don't. And I can't help who listens to my music or who comes to our shows. No one's ever complained about us on these shows that it's ever been a dangerous environment or anything like that. Everyone feels safe. And we love seeing parents come to the show. We hang out with our parents. In fact, I had some drinks with the parents at the bar and we, you know, kick shit and just talk. But, you know, um, you know, I even check IDs. I literally, any person I hang out with after a show, I check their ID. If they're not 18 and up, um, you know, if they're 18, I hang out with them. If they're younger than 18, I'm like, bye, Felicia. You, Davi, have never acknowledged Jesse Slaughter outside of you mocking her, aka Damien, or Diana, the original person who made a report against you and then, when the parent found out, demanded that you cut contact with her and that she'll drop the charges made against you, which I still can't comprehend why you would drop charges against someone simply for them cutting contact with your daughter. I don't care if somebody cut contact. The fact that you've participated in trying to groom or inappropriately engage with a minor, a 15 or 16 year old girl when you're, when you're almost 10 plus years older than them, just because there's no legal record of something doesn't mean that things didn't happen. I really think it's all coincidence that all these people have the same story that almost are all identical. With you taking somebody back, getting them alone, forcing your fingers or forcing them to do some sort of oral, gripping their hair. There's too much of a consistent pattern in every single case. It's just like with Bill Cosby and the whole giving them alcohol and spiking their drink. When you hear this thing so many times by so many people, now link down below in the description, I do have resources if you are struggling with something to this level of degree. If you have been SA'd in any context, please call that number. If you are struggling with mental health related issues because of your experience, with this man or other, there are resources linked down below in the description for you. But I need to be really clear that this man is a predator and that's not something I say often publicly about anyone. I didn't include every single survivor of who he has affected because as of right now, there's over 20 plus women who have stepped forward with their experience on Davi Vanity and that number is in fact growing. He now secretly resides on TikTok and Instagram doing live streams. You know, I see a lot of people that use my name for negativity and for awful things. Fuck those people. Uh, you know, we need to start using, uh, use my name for something good. And uh, importantly, this is more than, than me. Um, this isn't about me. This is about helping other people. And uh, of course, you know, uh, doing something that I believe in, that I love, and wearing things that I love and I adore. So, um, you know, I'm just tired of wearing like things that, that I just, I, I want to wear, like I, I want to pick out what I want to wear and do what I want to wear and represent a good cause and, and, and do something bigger than me because, uh, you know, despite uh, all the negativity that people say about my name or anything, I actually want to do something that is, uh, that, that's a positive cause and, uh, and something bigger than, than who I am. It's fuck ego, fuck narcissism, fuck all that bullshit. Um, you know, I wear my vanity like my armor but I want to do something that helps others, you know, like if I can, if my life can, can affect uh, a million people in a positive way, then I feel like then my life is, is worth it. One badge away. Sylvia, Sylvia Crow, 97 MVP. Thank you, Sylvia. You are awesome. All right, guys, we reached our goal. All right, here we go. fucking Christ. How do people pay money on Instagram, TikTok, for him to play a song? This is dreadful. This is atrocious. I have permanent ear damage. Your popularity is dwindling. You're now a 40-year-old man on TikTok and Instagram attempting to appeal of what few left of your audience that you have. Now, I found this TikTok account, which I believe to be his main uh, new TikTok account, but he had two TikToks on there that were very, very quickly uh, deleted, primarily because the ratio, the like ratio had... I, I saw this before it was before I was even able to take a screenshot, but it had about 200 likes, but over 1,000 comments, which is a, a huge ratio to, to like and comment ratio on TikTok. That's actually a huge thing. You don't see that very often of a bunch of kids. <laughs> 
technically bullying him, if you want to call it that, being really calling him names and all sorts of things and, and linking the articles and all that stuff, and then he removed it. So as of right now, his TikToks are gone, but every once in a while, he just kind of creeps out of nowhere, then kind of runs away, creeps out of nowhere, runs away again. Allegedly, there's an FBI case involvement with Dobby Vanity ongoing, or so I've heard. I haven't been able to confirm that 100%. All I can really hope is that that's really ongoing and that maybe perhaps something can happen down the line of him giving caught, considering that his own ex-girlfriend even admits that this type of behavior that he exhibits is normal.